Hello, my name is Jim McKenzie, and I work for the Mariposa County Resource Conservation District. This is the second video in our Oak Management series, entitled Disturbances. So, what exactly do we mean by disturbance? A disturbance is anything that alters the oak's circumstances, either positively or negatively. Examples of negative disturbances are drought, climate change, flood, earthquake, unnatural moisture level, ground or soil alteration, and construction in or near the oak's root protection zone. Fire is an example of a disturbance that can be either negative because of a high-intensity blaze which kills the trees, or positive if the fire is of low intensity. In fact, low-intensity fires can be particularly helpful to oaks. We thought it would be a good idea to discuss some of the disturbances that are both common and likely, describe their effects, and list actions that a landowner can take to minimize any negative effects. We have divided the collection of disturbances into three subtopics, drought and climate change, fire, and landscaping and development. The first subtopic is drought and climate change. First, we want to describe a strategy used by blue oaks during a drought period to compensate for a shortage of water. Some oaks are deciduous, which means that when the fall season arrives, the green leaves turn red, orange, and brown, and then fall from the tree to the ground. This is called senescence. In the spring, the tree sprouts new leaves. During a drought period, if the tree detects a shortage of groundwater during the summer, it will quote-unquote go dormant and drop its leaves earlier in the season to avoid losing water to transpiration for the remainder of the summer. This is called summer deciduous. The landowner needs to recognize summer deciduous as a natural occurrence that does not necessarily mean the tree is dying or that it is going to die. Of course, death may occur if the water shortage lasts too long. This image was part of a workshop presentation on drought and bark beetles given in 2015 in Mariposa by Dr. Martin McKenzie, forest pathologist with the United States Forest Service. What you see in the background and midground is a stand of blue oaks that have gone summer deciduous because of a shortage of groundwater. What you see in the foreground is a stand of blue oaks that have accessed sufficient groundwater to stay green. The difference in condition is because the green trees in the foreground are in a depression in the ground and their root systems were able to reach groundwater. The summer deciduous trees on higher ground are simply too far above groundwater to get a sufficient amount of it and are turning brown and shedding their leaves early as a survival mechanism. This image shows two sets of blue oak leaves. The small stunted ones at the top are taken from a tree that has been adversely affected by a water shortage. Trees containing mostly stunted leaves like these will probably not survive. The larger group at the bottom are taken from healthy blue oaks and are shown for contrast. These images show a stand of canyon live oaks arrayed along an intermittent stream bed. The stream bed is shown in the left-hand bottom image. The bed is lined with rocks and gravel laying on bedrock. The oak identified by the orange arrow in the left-hand image is in poor condition, having displayed a sparse crop of small leaves. The right side of the tree has missing branches, having been removed because they appeared to have died and seemed dangerous to people underneath. Canyon live oak death or damage in riparian areas during the recent California drought was common. This was caused by the existence of bedrock below the stream bed surface, which inhibited the tree's root system from going deep enough to access the retreating groundwater. Going deep was unnecessary in normal weather cycles because the stream bed usually either carried flowing water or at least had water under the gravel and out of sight on top of the bedrock. The right-hand image shows some of the remaining branches after the drought ended. You can see where the branches thought to be dead were cut off, shown by the orange arrow. You can also see new foliage sprouting further up on the remaining branches, shown by the red arrows. It may well be that the branches that someone cut off, thinking that they were dead, would have sprouted and survived if given a chance. The next subtopic deals with wildfire and its effects on oaks. Oaks have evolved in a region where wildfires are a key part of the ecosystem, and in times past, they occurred frequently. Oak species found in California are well adapted to wildfire, though individual trees may or may not survive a fire, depending on several factors. 
It depends primarily on the amount of fuel built up under and around the tree. Since many oak woodlands have not had regular fire for many decades, the amount of dead wood and litter has built up, causing fires that do occur to become more severe. This lack of fire has also allowed other trees to grow up underneath oaks and weaken them and their ability to withstand fires. On the other hand, fire can be beneficial to oaks if the fuel under and around the tree is absent, causing a low-intensity blaze. Even if the entire tree appears dead, some species can sprout roots and new foliage from the root crown and sometimes even from the branches above. The degree of sprouting depends on the species. In general, evergreen oaks are better sprouters, although blue oaks and black oaks have displayed sprouting ability in recent studies. It should be noted that if foliage turns brown after a fire, this alone seldom causes lasting damage. Damage and death come from burn injuries to the trunk, specifically to the bark, and mostly to the thin layer underneath the bark, known as the cambium. The important takeaway here is this. To reduce the risk of a fire getting too hot for a tree and killing it, you must remove ground fuels and ladder fuels near oaks. This image portrays the different layers that exist within the trunk of a tree. The outer bark, the inner bark, the cambium, and finally, the wood. This diagram is, of course, not to scale. The cambium is the most important layer. If most of it survives intact and undamaged, the tree will probably survive. The tree, in fact, can survive on as little as 10% of its cambium, though it will, of course, be in poor condition. Here are some guidelines for determining if a tree that has been exposed to a wildfire might live or die. First, remember what was presented in part one of this series. Size matters. Large trees stand a better chance of tolerating a burn. And species matters. Some species have thicker bark than others and therefore have more tolerance to wildfire. Look for the bad signs on the tree. Bark that has been blackened and charring that has reduced the bark thickness or charring that has occurred the entire way around the circumference of the trunk. Almost certainly, the tree will not survive if the bark is cracked and separated from the wood. An accurate way to determine cambium state is to cut away some bark and look at it. If the cambium is white or pink, the tree may be okay. If the cambium is dark or yellowish, then probably not. To get a complete treatment of how to diagnose a burnt tree, we recommend that you access http colon colon forward slash anrcatalog.ucdavis.edu Publication number 8445. The ground around this tree was burnt by a low intensity fire, perhaps leaves and dry grass and a bit of brush. The rising heat from the fire caused the leaves to turn brown. They will soon fall off. This is similar to the summer deciduous symptom described earlier. In all probability, the tree will soon lose its leaves and will sprout new ones in the following spring. We can then call it a healthy tree. This is an example of a tree stump that had completely lost its top in a wildfire and that had sprouted several or perhaps even many new branches. It looks like the landowner pruned away most of the shoots, leaving two or three to continue growing. The practice of thinning multiple sprouting shoots after a year or so will produce something like a tree rather than a bush. Most oaks can sprout, especially evergreen oaks, and young oaks have a stronger tendency to sprout than older oaks. This is a good example of ladder fuel growing around a tree. Ladder fuel can be dead limbs dropping from the tree, or it can be deer brush or some other flammable shrub growing close to the tree. When burned, the ladder fuel will create a much higher intensity fire than if the ground fuel around the tree was merely grass. It could also carry fire up into the foliage of the tree, causing further injury, hence the term ladder fuel. The act of clearing should be to cut the ladder fuel plant off even with the ground in the area surrounding the trunk, for a minimum distance even with the tree's drip line. The remaining stump can be painted with undiluted herbicide to prevent it from growing back. Carrying out regular small broadcast burns under oaks will also reduce the new shrubs and trees and prevent them from growing up into the oak canopy as ladder fuels. This is the last subtopic in the oak series video entitled Disturbances. The previous subtopics dealt with disturbances that are large scale, climate change, drought, and wildfire. This subtopic deals with disturbances which are local and human caused, usually by some sort of construction.
The image you see here defines three circular zones with the tree in the middle. The inner circle defines an area approximately six feet from the root crown. This is the fungus danger zone and every attempt should be made to keep this area dry during spring, summer, and fall. The next outer circle is defined by what is called the drip line, determined by the outermost reach of the tree foliage. The next outer circle is called the root protection zone and extends out for a distance of one and a half times the distance from the trunk to the drip line. Oaks are susceptible to oak root fungus, which can kill a tree. The fungus danger zone is a six foot radius from the trunk as shown in the previous panel. The combination of moisture and heat from hot weather enables growth of the fungus. The onset of climate change can create the problem in spring and fall as well. Generally though, the period from November through March can be considered safe. Oaks are mostly resistant to large-scale disturbance, such as wildfire, drought, and climate change. Oaks are less resistant to localized changes that affect their roots in the root protection zone. A common kind of disturbance results from construction activities, grading, trenching, backfilling, and irrigation or water table modifications. The effect of these operations in or near the root protection zone can result in loss of tree health or even tree death. It may take several years of slow decline, but degradation or death can happen. Here we see a trench, probably dug by a machine. In all probability, roots were cut in the process, which degrades the health of the tree. This shows a list of miscellaneous practices which can harm oaks if the placement interacts with the root protection zone. Here we see a paved parking lot on top of an oak's root protection zone. This prevents water from permeating the soil to reach the roots. A deck, like this one, can cause fungus growth on the ground, which can harm the tree. The combination of retaining wall, grade change, and paving will certainly impair the health of this tree. Here we see a common practice, construction of a patio using flagstones for paving and a retaining wall to provide a level surface. All of this affects the tree's roots and can lead to oak decline. Here we see both paving over the root protection zone and landscaping up close to the root crown, requiring water during the warm season. Mature trees that were not previously watered can be damaged by the application of irrigation. If you absolutely must landscape around your oaks, we strongly suggest the use of native plants that do not require summer water. We have shown only the common names of these plants here. You can find out more about them by looking them up in the CalPhotos database. Choose the plant section and use the common plant names we have given you. This concludes the video on disturbances. We encourage you to view the next two videos in the Oak series, Part 3, Maintenance, and Part 4, Propagation.